Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. We're thrilled to have you here with us. Our webinar today is on 21st century social contract, building more inclusive state society relations through volunteering. Um, as we are charting a bold new path to development where people and planet prosper, it requires a reset in our ways of working and collaborating. But what would a new social contract between citizens and states that secures rights and dignity for all and leaves no one behind look like? How do we make sure that the state accounts and addresses the needs of groups that are often excluded from decision making, such as refugees, persons with disabilities, and Indigenous peoples? And what is the role of volunteerism in ensuring that structures and systems provide inclusive outcomes for all people and groups? This is what we'll be discussing today. My name is Arati Krishnan. I am thrilled to be here with you. I am the Strategic Foresight Advisor for UNDP. Uh, to describe myself, I am online here with very big glasses on and a black top, so those of you might be able to, to find me through the various uh, Zoom faces that might be on your computer right now. I am thrilled to have an amazing group of experts here with us to deep dive into these topics and speak to us from their experience and expertise about what a new social contract might look like. Our webinar today will go for one hour. Um, we will have a set of expert presentations that will go for 30 minutes. We will have a 15 minute question and answer session where participants may be able to pose uh, their questions to our expert panelists. And then we will close at exactly 4 p.m. Um, CET. Some ground rules before we get started. Uh, you should be able to, you will be able to pose your questions through the Q&A function on the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. Please do not use the chat box. We will be responding and to questions posed through the Q&A. The closed captioning will be provided um, and you will be able to access it. If you do need some assistance, please do put a message in the chat box if you run into difficulties. If you are wanting to um, uh, speak, please do avoid jargon and acronyms. And we're aiming to speak in a clear and concise way using easy to understand plain language today. Our agenda for today, as I've said, we will have expert presentations that will go for 30 minutes, some Q&A for 15 minutes, and then a, and then a close. It is my deep pleasure to introduce our panelists for today. Uh, we are first joined by James Atem Macker from the Tertiary Connected, who is a Tertiary Connected Learning Coordinator at UNHCR. He is a UNV affiliated staff as the, in this capacity, following the construction of Turkana West University in Kakuma Camp in Kenya. He has previous experience as a part-time lecturer at Masindi Muluri, Muliro University of Science and Technology, whose deafness and capability are auspicious in conflict management, international relations, diplomacy, political issues, administrative work, community development, as well as disaster management. He holds a bachelor's degree in conflict resolution and humanitarian assistance and a master's degree in diplomacy and international relations from the Graduate School of Masinde Muliro University of Science and Technology. James is a prospective student at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs for a master's of international affairs in the fall term of 2021. We are also joined by Aaron Bateman, who is the Director of Volunteer Cooperation for WUSC, World University Service of Canada. Aaron has held leadership positions in a number of volunteering for development organizations over the past 20 years, including with VSO in the UK and QSO International in Canada and Ethiopia. Erin started out as a volunteer in Kenya with Crossroads International and went on to get a master's in development studies from the London School of Economics. She is an active member of Canada's Volunteer Cooperation Program Coordination Group um, and has also served on a number of not-for-profit boards. 
We're also thrilled to have Jane Mutumbi with us, who is a policy specialist in research and evidence for the voluntary advisor services section at United Nations Volunteers, where she is managing the research for the upcoming 2022 State of the World's Volunteerism Report. Her background is in socioeconomic policy research and analysis at national and international levels. It is our deep pleasure to also have Laura Dena Dixky, uh, from the, who's the International Communications and Memberships Officer for the European Disability Forum. Laura Dena joined the European Disability Forum in 2015 and is responsible for the communication between members and the Secretariat. She has worked on European youth projects since 2005, previously also with Views International, um, as well as working in a school for blind in Romania, her origin country. Loredana holds a master's degree in inclusive education from the University Bab Zibolyai in Cluj-Napoca and a master's degree in psychology from the University of leuven la Neuve. Odilia Romero, who is the co-founder and executive director of Comunidades Indigenas en Liderazgo, is, is, it's a privilege to have you with us today, Odilia. Odilia is an independent interpreter of Zapotec, Spanish and English for indigenous communities in Los Angeles and throughout California. She has over a decade of experience organizing indigenous migrant communities. Her organizing knowledge and experience are held in high regard with multiple academic publications, awards, and lectures in universities across the United States, including John Hopkins, USC, and UCLA. Ms. Romero has published on the challenges of organizing in indigenous communities, developing women's leadership and preparing a new generation of youth. Her work has also been featured in the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, Vogue and Democracy Now. And lastly, we are thrilled to be also joined by Rosario Galarza, the Intersectionalities Officer at the International Disability Alliance. Rosario joined IDA uh, for the Capacity Building Unit. She is responsible for strengthening the inclusion of women with disabilities and underrepresented identities in IDA's work. Prior to joining IDA, Rosario worked as a Human Rights Officer at RIADIS, RIADIS, where she supported OPDs in the implementation and monitoring of uh, the Agenda 2030, prioritizing activities related to the rights of women with disabilities and underrepresented groups. From 2013 to 2016, Rosario was appointed as Chair of Gender and Equality in the Latin America Uni Union of the Blind, ULAC. As a chair of gender inequality, she promotes the realization of different blind women's meetings in different countries of Latin America to spread the rights recognized in CEDAW and CRPD. Rosario is based in Peru. Thank you everybody to our esteemed group of speakers for joining us. It is, I'm really excited to deep dive into these questions for today. And without further ado, I'm going to go to our first panelist, uh, Jane Muthumbi. Jane, over to you. Thank you, Arati, for the introduction. Um, again, my name is Jane Muthumbi, and in terms of describing myself, I'm also wearing large glasses and uh, you, uh, having a checkered top that, uh, you know, uh, just to, to make it clear for those who, who may be looking uh, on the screen. So um, I will basically uh, provide an overview of uh, the report that um, Arathi uh, briefly described. Uh, this year's State uh, of the World Volunteerism Report is uh, the fourth uh, flagship report that the UNV uh, is, is preparing. Um, so in terms of just the history, uh, the, the flagship report is designed to provide evidence on the contribution of uh, volunteers to peace and development, which is the uh, sustainable development goal that uh, uh, peace and development falls under. Uh, so just very briefly, the first uh, report was produced in 2011, and it basically looked at uh, the theme was on volunteerism and well-being. The second one was in three years later, in 2015, um, looking at uh, governance issues, how volunteerism uh, interacts with governance. Uh, the third one was on uh, 
uh, was themed, uh, the theme of the report was on the thread that binds and basically looked at uh, community uh, relationships in terms of uh, volunteers at community levels. And this year's report uh, titled Volunteerism in the 21st Century Social Contract uh, basically looks at uh, the interaction, the participation, the, sorry, the partnerships between people and uh, states uh, and their obligations. And we're going to talk a little bit in, um, about that in a, in a short while. Um, as I've mentioned, the report is produced every three years and uh, three years from now, there'll be the theme for the next one will be on volunteerism measurement. Uh, and then in 2027, uh, the report will look at volunteerism and inequalities. And um, sort of at the end of the SDGs, uh, the theme of that report in 2030 will look at the post-2030 uh, development agenda. The purpose of the SWVR, or the report that we are producing, uh, uh, is basically uh, to provide recommendations to policymakers. Uh, and uh, that is actually the key focus of this year's report, which is slightly different from the previous reports that were produced. So uh, when we get uh, you know, onto the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the report itself, but uh, the goal this year is to basically have some recommendations that then policymakers uh, you know, can work with as far as improving uh, volunteerism. Um, so as uh, mentioned, uh, the theme of this year's report is on the social contract, uh, basically, and well, we think of a social contract as that uh, arrangement between actors in society uh, and their mutual obligations and rights, uh, basically between people and states. So as mentioned, um, we are looking at uh, how people and states, and by people, you know, civil society groups, volunteers, how they work together through three specific um, models of collaboration. And for the report, we'll be looking at deliber deliberative governance, basically uh, looking at uh, how citizens participate in dialogue processes. Uh, working together with states. So we are looking at issues outside the framework of their elections, uh, basically how they might partner uh, with, uh, so in this case, volunteers with uh, the government representatives, how they might partner together on a particular issue. Um, so that is one model that we'll be looking at. The second one is on co-production of services um, and social protection. Uh, and under this model, we'll be looking at how volunteers work directly with state authorities, uh, basically to deliver services in a range of areas, whether it's health, education, um, for persons with disabilities, uh, and uh, looking at um, issues of how they engage and uh, the degree to which uh, people have voice in these processes uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully get to learn some lessons there that, again, will inform policymakers. Uh, the third area or the third model that we'll be looking at is on social innovation. And basically, under this one, we are looking at um, how uh, volunteers or civil society groups uh, work together with states, basically, uh, to identify uh, solutions, new solutions to a social problem. Uh, so in addition to perhaps there being um, a technological innovation that could help in that, we also look at other uh, ways uh, that may not be tech related. So it's, it's a broad area. Um, and so uh, Whatever results we get uh, from the, these three models, they'll help us in terms of formulating policy recommendations that then um, policymakers can use to inform uh, their decision making around uh, basically emerging models that can uh, support and create ownership of people and uh, in bringing uh, all groups, uh, basically facilitating the inclusion of different groups, uh, which is what uh, this, uh, this uh, webinar is all about. 
So um, if we could move to the next slide. Um, in terms of just uh, the report itself, in addition to the research on the three models, uh, there are two other chapters uh, that will encompass this report. So one of the chapters is on uh, volunteering estimates. This work is done by the International Labor Organization. They basically look at estimates of volunteer work uh, in different uh, global regions. Um, in addition to that chapter, there'll be a chapter on, a, on an eight country survey uh, that was done by uh, Gallup. Uh, basically, they surveyed uh, volunteer participation during COVID and also wanted to determine to what extent uh, COVID has influenced uh, volunteers' um, expectations or plans to volunteer beyond um, the pandemic once the pandemic is over. Uh, this uh, study was undertaken in eight countries in the global south, uh, which is actually the focus of the report. Uh, I should have mentioned that. Uh, and it was done in uh, Colombia, Kenya, uh, Turkey, um, India, um, and I forget the other two, but anyway, it was done in eight countries. Um, and then um, in addition to those two, which are the quality, quality quantitative chapters, we are going to get into the qualitative chapters, which are based on the uh, three models that we talked about. So there'll be a specific chapter on the deliberative governance. There'll be a specific chapter on collaboration, uh, on uh, co-production of services and social protection. And there'll be a chapter on social innovation. Um, in addition, we are also going to have uh, contributions uh, from specific um, uh, specific groups, whether that is a, a volunteer, a representative from civil society, as well as government representatives and private sector members, as well as from the UN. Um, and again, uh, volunteer voices will be uh, uh, will be uh, illustrated throughout the report. So that basically, I think, uh, just gives a broad overview in terms of uh, the research uh, and the report for uh, 2021. Um, and so I give it back to Arathi. Thank you so much, Jane. What a fantastic uh, report. This is going to be congratulations on the incredible thought uh, and, and rigor that's gone into this. We are very much looking forward to it coming up. Um, it is with deep pleasure I introduce our next expert panelist, Odelia. Odelia is going to be speaking to us about deliberative governance and volunteering. Um, as a reminder, Odelia Romero, who's the executive director of Comunidades Indigenas and Liderazgo. And there are two questions that Odelia is going to talk through. How can volunteering shape deliberative governance processes, such as citizen assemblies, national dialogues, to be more inclusive and to amplify the voices of those left behind? And a question to be posed to Adelia that we would love for her to think through based on your experiences. What are three key takeaways on how volunteering can shape institution and norms for more inclusive development outcomes? Uh, Adelia, over to you. We're thrilled to have you with us. Um, good morning. My, uh, um, thank you for the inclusion and it's a pleasure for me to be here. Well, um, I have like a few stages to write of um, volunteerism. Um, as an indigenous community that has been displaced to the United States, the only way we survived was through being volunteers and recreating our societies here in, in Los Angeles. Uh, my community started migrating from uh, Southern Mexico since the Bertero program and it increased in the 60s, 70s and the largest um, uh, migration happened in after 1994. Um, so with that, you know, we recreated uh, our community here having a leadership structure, but it's all based on volunteers. So we have a meeting, like if we were back home, everybody comes and gives an opinion. We elect our le uh, our leaders and every single one of them 
are volunteers and everything that we do like from continuing our ceremonies for continuing our leadership if somebody dies every uh, that leadership goes house and house throughout at los angeles county to collect money or goods for the family in need that's on one section of us maintaining together but we never go out and interact with the state but then the other section is the other organizations that have formed as political organizations, also as a volunteer, they interact with the states, uh, with, with the nation state. So that group, for example, the, we are very visible here in California as indigenous people uh, based on culture, based on a huge event of 20,000 indigenous people. But then we have the councilman or the mayor come to this event, right? And through this event, um, we have been able, like especially this year, uh, and, and we just had created a map actually about our existence in Los Angeles because as indigenous people from the South, they consider us Latinos or Mexicans. So we've done a lot of work through these other larger organizations to be identified as indigenous people living in Los Angeles, not Latinos. And uh, through that, uh, and this year, we ripped the benefits of all these major organizing with the nation state. We were able to get support um, for indigenous people during this crisis of the pandemic, right? So everybody, every, uh, we had meetings um, with different uh, stakeholders, but also with the community of what are the needs of indigenous communities in Los Angeles County, because our work is in Los Angeles County. We do have a nonprofit, Cielo is a nonprofit. It's um, actually, we're very young, six years um, of age. And all these past 20 years, all our work, my work and the team has been on volunteer. This is the first time that we actually have a woman led, woman co founded nonprofit. Uh, so that's very exciting to us. But also, our work is not possible without the volunteers, right? We still rely largely on the community to distribute food, to distribute uh, support and um, basic human rights needs uh, uh, here, like PPE material, especially during this year. I don't know that we would have survived without the volunteers. But we also had that conversation of our needs and of our existence that was done through the volunteers with the, the local elected officials here. So I think um, it's, for me, uh, the, the work of the, and, and we're very specific because we are indigenous people here in Los Angeles. So it is really hard to tell people, hey, we exist and here we are, and these are our needs. Like the community does not understand in Los Angeles, that overall community, that there are 21 indigenous languages spoken here. And each group, each indigenous group has a different need, right? So they, they organize and they do their volunteering and then they come to Cielo and they say, hey, we need this. And then we walk with them to the elected officials and these are our needs. But for us is the biggest challenge is to even be recognized as indigenous people in the United States, you know, because we're not indigenous people from the United States, but we are indigenous people from Mexico or Guatemala in Cielo, right? So I think um, the biggest uh, uh, takeaways for me as uh, the three things that for me are, are very important, like to con the, uh, here it is called volunteerism, but for us is the, the, the work for the benefit of all. Like we all work for the benefit of all. It's just not one person, it's just for all of us. And that contradicts the society that we live here in, 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 in the United States, right? Like everything is like my personal space, my thing. Um, and, and for us, no, it's like, we're gonna do this work. And we consciously, when the communities elect their leaders is like, you know, you're gonna do this for the benefit of all. And not just for you, 
and, and is not to be popular or have clout, but it's actually for uh, the community. And I think for us, it's very important to continue this in order to survive uh, in the United States as people from south of the imposed border. And also, um, there are things that get, as a nonprofit, we don't have enough um, financial stability to be able to hire every single person, right? Each event that we have, there's only 12 of us at Cielo, sometimes some part-time, some full-time, but the work that we do needs more than 12 people. And we would not exist without the solidarity of all the other indigenous people here in LA County. Like when we have a vaccination site, uh, suddenly we have 20 people besides us. They're helping unload food, helping give PPE materials, you know, and for us, it, this is just how we're gonna survive in the US. If suddenly we as indigenous people become very um, self-absorbed and we're, our, our whole society will collapse as indigenous people here, right? So for us, it's crucial to maintain uh, what we call tekyo or guzuna um, is the solidarity and the work for the benefit of every single one of us here in in, in, this, in LA County in, in this particular case. But I'm talking to you about Cielo, but there's other organizations, uh, other volunteers group throughout the US that are indigenous that are doing this work. And you know, we are new to uh, in talking to the state, um, to elected officials, it, it becomes challenging too because of the language barrier, right? Um, not everybody speaks Spanish, not everybody speaks English. And that is hard for people to understand like the diversity of the languages of, of Mexicans and Guatemalans throughout the US. But I think um, for us, it's uh, a survival. Um, without our volunteerism, without our, um, our, our thank you or the work for the benefit of all, uh, we will not exist. So for us, it's so important because that's a survival tool for us. Thank you. Adelia, thank you so much. I'm really resonating with your point about work for the benefit of all. Um, I remember as a young person in my community, you know, we always volunteered and helped each other. It was just what we did, but we didn't know it was called volunteering. It was just what you did for your aunties and uncles and your neighbors. And, and, and it's how, how we all thrive and not just survive, but to thrive in the spaces that we're in. Thank you so much for sharing your, your wisdom and knowledge. Um, and, 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 and we've learned so much from that. Um, we're now going to go to Rosario. Rosario Galarza, as a reminder, is the intersectionality officer for the International Disability Alliance. And Rosario is going to talk to us today about the co-production and volunteering for inclusive development outcomes. And the question that Rosario is going to work through is how can volunteers involvement in the co-production of public services, such as health, education, safety nets, together with state authorities, help achieve more inclusive and equitable outcomes for all? Rosario, we're over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, definitely, it's a very hard question that I will try to maybe give some ideas in these five minutes. And I would like to start saying that this is not only for persons with disabilities. When we are talking about diversity, we consider that we include persons with disabilities, but also we include everyone. That's why the things that I'm going to explain today can apply for all persons from different and diverse backgrounds. Um, well, um, I think the presentation uh, in the second slide, um, I think we have some features that allow us to evaluate, monitor the quality of the services, and also to design services in order to be more inclusive and equitable. These features are really interconnected. These features come from the Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities, the committee draft 
um, general comment on 2016 using this feature, but also it has been taken, they were taken from the, the committee on the rights of um, social, economic, and cultural rights in the resolution. And this is, these are called the four A's. And one, what does that mean? We have four A's that are accessibility, availability, adaptability, acceptability. And we hope to go, we go to the next slide, please. Um, we are going to start with availability. What means availability in order to talk about inclusive and friendly services? It means that all the services provided need to be available and sufficient, not only in quantity, but also in quality for all, for everybody. It means that schools, hospitals, other public services need to be close to the families. We don't need to walk two or three kilometers to find a school or to find um, a health service. And that's why if everything is available, definitely we're gonna have more inclusion. Um, we're, gonna have, we're gonna have services for everyone. Next slide, please. And now we have accessibility. This is really important. This is not only a precondition for exercising the right, it's also a right. It is Article 9 on the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And it's also a principle of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And definitely, it says that all the services and programs need to be accessible. Accessible means also friendly to all without discrimination. It means everything, not only, we are not talking about only for architectural barriers, we're also talking about information, for instance, communication, website, audio description for blind and, and partially sighted, captioning and everything, which means that the event needs to be accessible. That's a precondition for exercising our rights and also is a, a key issue to promote the participation of persons with disability. Next slide, please. Now we are in the, the third feature is acceptability. Acceptability is the obligation of all services and programs providers to design services and products who can be respect of person's needs, culture, and also opinions and language of person with disability. Accessibility teaches how to value diversity and how to think about diversity as part of the human condition. This is very related with the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, especially the principles of respect for human diversity, respect for the difference. And also accessibility help us to provide equality of opportunities. Next slide, please. We have now adaptability. In this case, adaptability, we, we consider that we need to do some modifications, some adaptations in order to be more inclusive, in order to to try that services can be equitable for everyone and to respond to the different requirements and needs of persons with disabilities. Accessibility can also imply the use of reasonable accommodation. And accessibility is very linked to CRPD principles, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability principles regarding non discrimination, equality, and opportunity, and um, also respect for inherent dignity and independence and participation, effective participation and inclusion. I would like to emphasize here that we are using these principles, but if we want to be maybe more general, we can say that, that all the core human rights principles include participation, non-discrimination and equality. If we are thinking about how to be more inclusive, how to be more equitable for all, 
we need to consider to eliminate the barriers that definitely persons with disability face. These barriers can be not only environmental barriers, but also can be attitudinal barriers, which are very difficult to eliminate, such as prejudice, misconceptions, wrong assumptions. And also can be institutional barriers, which can be discriminatory policies everywhere of this country, discriminatory programs in governments in different countries. I would like to emphasize that definitely it's very important the work of volunteers to help, for instance, in different events to promote the participation of persons with disabilities and to start to think about how to design these services more inclusive and equitable for all instead of monitoring if the quality is good or not. If we think first to design services like that, we're not going to be concerned about the quality of the service because definitely these services are going to be more inclusive for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rosario. And I really love the four A's and how important that is to all issues of intersectionality for all of us. Um, now we go to Loredana Dixie, who's the internal communications and membership officer of the European Disability Forum. So as a reminder, uh, Loredana uh, herself has been a European volunteer in 2005 and in her previous job, and is now as a volunteer in supporting blind and partially sighted volunteers to also join the European volunteering experience. Loredana is going to speak to us today to answer the question that based on her experience, what are the three key takeaways on how volunteering can shape institutions and norms for more inclusive development outcomes. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, for me, it's afternoon here. I am um, from speaking from Belgium, from Leuven, a university city, uh, not far from the capital, really. From, um, so I'm really uh, honored to join today. Uh, and thank you very much. I think the most important thing, first of all, is uh, the mindset. Mindset, why? Like more than 20 years ago, when I went uh, to an organization in my origin country, Romania, and I wanted to do volunteering work, they never came back to me. I filled in all kind of forums and they never came back to me. So like the volunteer was seen as a healthy person, charitable with some time to give. But pers we as persons with disabilities, I'm myself uh, almost blind. We don't want to be only receptacles or how, um, yeah, of getting help we want also to give to give um, our energy to give from our time to give our competencies and i'd say um, the first thing to take uh, towards the institutions would be to consider that persons with disabilities are first of all persons Secondly, see the ability of the persons as institution and go into what, into what that person can do for, for your organization, your institution, concrete tasks to match uh, the profile of, of that volunteer. Third thing I would say, um, having a diversity in your pools of volunteers it's, it's certainly enriching for your organization. And it brings change because your attitude will, will change and you will become more inclusive. How can volunteering shape institutions in, in becoming more inclusive? For sure, in many ways. And I would say here also three things. Firstly, to welcome volunteers with disabilities what have cert to certainly ensure, and I bring forward what Rosario just said, the four A's, 
um, take appropriate measures to, to welcoming the volunteer in terms of accessibility, but also um, in terms of adaptability of, uh, of your environment and adequate, of course, distribution of the tasks. This means openness, reflection and awareness um, of how the volunteering in uh, environment and team can be prepared. And then the third thing is the positive experience of the volunteering will raise your esteem in regard to the abilities of persons with disabilities. So you will see the potential of those people and not the disability. So if you think that this is possible to do it within your team, within uh, your institution, then you will want to transfer to to do it further than uh, than here and this is really important and i would say for sure that for persons with disabilities uh, themselves also it is very important to say that finally you are people with the rights so use your rights and stand up for them. You are a person like anyone else with abilities and be open and trust yourself. You can do it. But I think it is very also important to, for institution, they have to build up this experience that they have learned while they have hosted uh, volunteer several go further and not only to volunteering take take stuff into your team um, build experience on on having people on board hire persons with disabilities hire refugees uh, people coming from refugees hire in people coming from an indigenous uh, area hire people with with other background this makes the richness of your um of your stuff and this is of of great importance and build up into your policy if you put down on paper this should be the measures that should be taken it it will this happens into your team if you have also influence further, then bring it also up further. And I think this is from my own experience. Whenever, when I went somewhere, I, I left from there. I know that what they have learned, those people, they did it further and they improved and they wanted to learn even more on accessibility, how to make their um, website, their materials, their information, their activities how to make them accessible, how to be more welcoming for persons with disabilities. And I think this can be absolutely done when you have met people with those um, specific requirements who can tell what do they need. So openness, change your mindset, make sure that you know that persons with disabilities are persons like anyone else and we want to give also our time to different things we are interested in and to bring change in those areas so thank you so much all right Dana, thank you that's so powerful i i i, I agree about the shift of needing to move from uh, people just being beneficiaries of the services that they receive, uh, but also to be, you know, directly involved in the design and implementation of those services. We are more than just um, our identities. We are we are full exactly. human beings. Thank you so much, Laura Dana, for 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 really you know pushing that point and, and provoking us to to consider all of that. Um, my great privilege now to go to our last expert presenter, to James Atem. Uh, James is going to talk to us about innovative solutions to social needs and volunteering. As a reminder, James is the tertiary connected 
learning coordinator with UNHCR. And he's going to attempt to answer uh, two questions. The first, similar to previous presenters, what are the three key takeaways on how volunteering can help shape institutions and norms for more inclusive and development outcomes? Um, but importantly as well, how are refugees innovating through volunteering to address their needs and those of their communities? James, we're over to you. Thank you so much, Arathi, for this opportunity. Actually, I felt privileged uh, to participate in this year's webinar under the theme, 21st Century Social Contract, Building More Inclusive State-Society Relations Through Volunteering. Uh, and, to, and to my first question, which reads, how are refugees innovating through volunteering to address their needs and those of their communities? First of all, I would like to provide a rough overview of the term social innovation. Uh, in my understanding, social innovations means new ideas or approaches that when implemented, provide positive impacts for the public benefits. First, first and foremost is mentorship program. I have had the, I have had the opportunity to actually participate under mentorship program for the university students and, and secondary students in various secondary schools in the camp myself being a DAFI scholar and uh, this program is funded by the UNHCR and other international organizations. This is a scholarship that actually targets students from the refugee camp and these students are taken to various secondary schools in, in various cities of Kenya. I was actually lucky enough to get this opportunity and I was supported by a DAFI scholarship. Upon the uh, completion of my studies, I came back to Kakuma camp and I gave back to the community by being a volunteer. So I actually I invited some of my colleagues who, who also finished under DAFI scholarship and we came up with a refugee mentorship program whereby we moved around various secondary schools doing mentorship program so that we can encourage students to learn and pass very well and get access to this opportunity so that they can go to the university. Uh, we have also done the same thing for university students who are also taken under DAFI scholarship to various universities in Kenya Personally, I was invited uh, to attend conferences organized by DAFI, and I also took part in virtual conferences, and I also provided my experience, the path that I took during my studies in the university. And this has actually impacted most of the students because they followed suit, uh, whatever that I had done, is what they followed and most of them today are successful people in their various professions and in various countries that they came from. Uh, secondly, I did advocacy uh, in the camp, especially for scholarship opportunities. Some students who have not been taken for a number of years were assisted through my advocacy program whereby I took, I took this initiative and approached various organizations so that they can get assisted. Most of them being uh, disabled students. So I did this to provide inclusion, especially with regards to uh, scholarship opportunities for the refugee students. So most of the students who finished high school in the camp and, and some of them are disabled were not actually able to compete openly with the rest of, of students who are perfect. So I took this initiative and 
I approach various organizations so that these students can be considered. And uh, uh, luckily three students have been taken by Davis scholarship, two at a uh, University of Nairobi and one at Kenyatta University through my initiative. Uh, third thing is digital literacy training for the refugees to improve refugees' life through technology. And this is a project under the UNHCR Education Department where I work today. So uh, this is a project whereby we recruit students from various primary and secondary schools. And we have constructed each instant network school. We have actually constructed uh, one innovative uh, digital network at each secondary school. And, and we also employed some uh, coaches who will take through students through digital literacy. And these coaches reported directly to me. So on a weekly basis, I normally visit these schools to monitor uh, the progress, as well as in some, some technical institutions and the university, the, uh, the Trukana West University College that has been constructed in Kapmakam. So we have trained a number of students. This year, we targeted 15,000 students to be trained so that they can get equipped with digital skills to improve their lives uh, while in the camp. And by the time they will return back to the countries of origin. We have also come up with, uh, with a number of uh, community-based organizations. One of them, where I am a founder called Faulu, uh, participates in refugee empowerment. We do a number of uh, initiatives, one of them being uh, entrepreneurship training, whereby we recruit teachers and we support them to train refugee kids with entrepreneurship skills. And uh, luckily, some of them get fundings from, from the UNHCR and other uh, implementing partners through youth initiative funds. So these, these refugee kids are able to run local business while in the camp under our own uh, contribution. Second is uh, motorcycling and repair trainings. This CBO also provide training for, for, the, for the motorcycling and repair of these motorcycles so that whenever they get funds, they can be able to run their own business of buying a motorcycle. And in events that this motorcycle broke down, they can be able to repair it. And also, uh, women empowerment. There is a small uh, amount that we normally disperse to women and girls so that we can empower them, especially this vulnerable segment of population, the women and girls and the elderly uh, normally get assisted under this empowerment uh, a docket. We also have saloon and beauty training whereby we train young girls uh, on, on saloon and beauty training so that they can be able to run their local business uh, in the camp. And electrical and wiring training is also one of the things that we do under this CBO. And finally, adult uh, education. We also recruit uh, overage uh, people for training, especially for, for the primary school uh, education training so that they can be able to assist themselves wherever possible. And also we have distance learning training 
and uh, this is being supported by the UNHCR in a partnership with with United World Colleges around the world, and this falls under my docket, whereby I do mobilization of of uh, refugee students in the camp, and we award them these opportunities. It's fully funded, and uh, now refugees are able to to get this online training from Harvard University. Some courses are also offered from University of Adelaide and other various institutions around the world. So these universities offer online programs that are fully funded to refugees. So what I do is uh, just to mobilize these kids and to create awareness that we have some online programs that can benefit your lives. So this has been instrumental in the lives of refugees in Kakuma Kam. And, uh, and to my second question, which, which reads, based on your experience, what are the key takeaways on how volunteering can shape institutions and norms for more inclusive development outcomes? Involving uh, volunteers can add great value to the organization and provide support in achieving organizational mission and uh, strategic objectives. Some of the key takeaways that I have identified are volunteers deliver services and projects in a more effective way, which can help save money and, and resources for the organization. So, if the organization can actually recruit more uh, volunteers, then their duties can be executed timely and effectively. Build relationships within the community in which you work and contribute to supporting others in your community. And uh, this has been instrumental, especially for me, whereby I work for the, for the UNHCR and also uh, connect uh, refugee community with the UNHCR. And this has improved the image of the UNHCR in that both UNHCR plus the refugee community have good rapport with each other. And uh, finally, by providing volunteering opportunities, you provide opportunities for social inclusion, skills development, and potential rates of employment. So this has been uh, noted especially for the few volunteers who have worked for the UNHCR as well as other local agencies in the camp, whereby some of them were absorbed into mainstream uh, agencies. So some of them were absorbed into, into national uh, positions, international positions, and most of them were able to acquire skills that can actually support them in their lives and career advancement prospects. And uh, finally, uh, social inclusion. This has created inclusion in a way that refugees were actually brought on board to offer their services as well as other people from around the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, James. Thank you so much. And I love how your points also tie back to Laura Dennis' points around how those most on the receiving end of these are more than just their identities, but they're actively participating uh, every day through varieties of means um, to, to, to do change agent work, to do transformation work. Um, thank you so much to all our expert speakers. What wonderful insights. I have a couple of questions here for you. And I, the first one is addressed to Odilia. Uh, the question is from Paulino Bencosenjo. Uh, Odilia, the question is, was it difficult to call the attention of government to the plight of indigenous people at the time of the pandemic, given that the pandemic cut across everyone? 
Um, Adelia, over to you. That's a tough question. <laughs> It, it was very difficult. It, it, it was very difficult because we have to remember, as indigenous people here in in the United States that came from Mexico or Guatemala, many of us are undocumented, so we don't have the right to be here in the United States, right? So that limits your access to your rights as well. There's that status, that your immigration status. There was the language barrier and the type of work that indigenous people have here in the States. One is a lot of them worked uh, in the restaurant industry, in the garment industry, in the farm worker industry. So here it was really difficult, especially in LA, uh, in Los Angeles, that to even bring the attention to all the deaths of COVID that happened, COVID complications that happened in the garment industry here. There was no information in indigenous languages. As a nonprofit, we were the first ones to create information on um, COVID prevention in different indigenous languages. Uh, but as the, 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 the local, the government never paid attention to that indigenous people. Um, or the language diversity, and because of that, we were able, we were able, uh, well, as an organization, we were able to raise two million dollars to support indigenous people here in the county of LA. And through that, we created a map, a map of our existence, and created like a map of how many languages are spoken in Los Angeles County and what are our needs. And we as an organization went back and said, hey, Los Angeles County, this is your population. And we contribute to the economy of the city, of the state, of the country, because we're not only here in LA, but throughout California, indigenous people are the backbone of the farmer, uh, of the agricultural industry, you know? So uh, they were, we had no rights. So we had no access to all that cash, um, for the, what well, I don't remember what they call it, but to all the, the support that was given to documented people, we had no access to it. We had to create our own and we had to do a lot of the work uh, as a staff at 12 and all the volunteers to access the, the community. So it was very challenging. It has been challenges for us, for the state to acknowledge our existence as indigenous people from south of the imposed border here in the United States. And it's been, challenging to access to services. It's been challenging to access to information in the different indigenous languages. Sure, in LA we speak 21 languages, but throughout California, that is the same thing, right? Or in New York, you know, there's indigenous people all over and a lot of us uh, are undocumented. So it, it makes it very challenging, I think for us, um, we have to continue educating, um, you know, uh, the governing, uh, you know, the, the, the elected officials, one of our existence of our humanity as indigenous people. And that's a daily thing for us, you know? Adelia, you're, 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 the, the thing that you just said, mapping our mapping to prove our existence. Um, I can feel myself emotionally reacting to that. It's it's uh, what it's incredibly brave work, and you know it, it's linked so much to what Loredana and Rosario and James speak about, which is the when we apply homogeneity to inclusion, we deliberately put blinders on and not see the plethora of shades that that we all have and we don't fit into perfectly identifiable boxes that, that are often designed in very specific ways. Adelia, thank you. We've got one final question that we're wanting to pose to all our speakers today. And the question is, given what we have just heard, how does the relationships between citizens and states have to change? to ensure that this type of equity that we're talking about, this type of justice that we're talking about does come to bear, that we do have equitable progress and development for all. What is the one thing that, or one provocation that you would put out to say, this is how relationship, the relationship between citizens and states need to change? And perhaps, um, I'm not sure who wants to take that first, or I can ask, uh, or, or I can just, um, perhaps call on Loredana, if you would like to perhaps um, tackle that yes. question. Repeat once again the question, I'm sorry. 
That's okay, Loredetta. The question is, what would your suggestion be for how the relationship between citizens and states having needing to change to ensure that this equity that everybody um, has spoken about today does come to bear? Well, I think the most important point is to include citizen in their dialogue, have a dialogue and th this way they, they will avoid um, uh, not uh, being exclusive. I think this is the, the most important point for me. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Laura Dana. I wonder if there's anybody else that wants to come in on that question. Rosario? Yes, thank you. I think um, apart from inclusion, for me, the, um, the key word is participation. Because I mean, if states need to, to see that citizens are person who can participate in all decision making process. That's why I mean, with participation, definitely we're going to change the relationship between the government and the citizens. Absolutely, thank you so much, Rosario. In dialogue and participation. Is there anybody else? Adelia, did you want to come in? Um, yes, I, I think for us, because we have been displaced to the United States, for us it's very important for people to know the migration routes, right? Because we are criminalized as we are here in the US as indigenous people of these lands of the Americas, right? So it's, uh, and I think for, it's it's important to know the, the, the roots of displacement I, and for um, for people to know about the diversity of the Americas of language and how we end up here, overall is being inclusive of everyone, of everyone to be able to have that participation and di dialogue um, in the, the different languages with the, our different disabilities. And I think those are the th that. Thank you so much, Adelia. And thank you to our amazing panelists today for such provocative, uh, rigorous, thoughtful um, uh, inputs into, into this very, very complex um, uh, question that we are interrogating through today's webinar. Thank you deeply for, for leaning in and, and, and tackling it and to holding all of us to account uh, to, to ensure our, our, our efforts for change and equity you know, do, do come to good, to good fruition. It is with great pleasure that I now turn um, over to Aaron Bateman, who is, uh, is the Director of Volunteer Cooperation for WUSC. Erin uh, is going to give a brief overview of Forum's evidence work on inclusion, and also the outlook to IFCO 2021 on the theme of inclusive volunteering and global equality. Erin, over to you. Thanks, Anati, and I'll just take a few moments Hi everyone, my name is Erin Bateman and I'm the Director of Volunteer Cooperation at WUSC uh, in Canada. Um, I'm also a forum board member and I co-facilitate forums, diversity and inclusion community of practice. And I'll tell you what forum is in just a moment. Um, I'm very grateful for being included here. This has been a fascinating conversation led by a very inspiring panel. So it, I it really um, has brought up a lot of questions and, and, and uh, I appreciate everyone's full contributions. The International Forum for Volunteering and Development is a global network of organizations that exists to share information and develop good practice and enhance cooperation across the volunteering for development sector. Um, I think it would be very fair to say that forum members are across the board wrestling with questions of inclusion within our organizations and across our sector as a whole. We set up a diversity and inclusion community of practice where we share experiences and innovative approaches and good practice. Some of the priorities for this group identified collectively at the beginning of our, of our time together were to support each other in creating environments and where people can feel free and feel capable to speak up and challenge culture and behaviors. We want to support our organizations to embed diversity and inclusion in organizational strategies and to work together to foster an inclusive volunteering for development infrastructure, which promotes as broad access to volunteer opportunities as possible and ensures that volunteer experiences promote understanding of people from different groups. 
So we meet monthly for presentations and discussion and action planning, and it's it's very open and welcoming environment. So so every, anyone's welcome to attend. We've had presentations and discussions looking at inclusion as it relates to youth, disability, socioeconomic barriers, and sexual orientation, gender identity, expression, and sex characteristics. In May, we had a session facilitated by Alto Learn, which challenged us in our organizations to do better, improve our programming, our culture, our practice, and to provide us, provide us with some tips and strategies for how to do that. And then just last week, we had a really lively discussion in response to reading the Peace Direct report, Time to Decolonize Aid. For all of these, these conversations and learning opportunities are part of a process. We're all learning, we're humbled by the work ahead of us, and we're committed to trying to do better in our organizations and as, and as individuals. The other thing that I wanted to note about Forum is that every year we host a conference it's called IVCO, and we convene uh, volunteering for development leaders, volunteers, state actors, researchers from around the globe in a dialogue focused on the challenges and opportunities facing our sector. So this year's IVCO is on the theme, Inclusive Volunteering for Global Equality, and it has three sub-themes of decolonization, digitalization, and directionality. In the lead up to the conference, we're commissioning a number of research pieces. The main framing paper aims to locate volunteering for development within the wider conversation on decolonizing aid and development and movements such as Black Lives Matter. So through this research, we'll be asking, what is the future of volunteering for development in the context of decolonized aid and development? What has to fundamentally shift in this sector in order to remain relevant and critical to development cooperation efforts? The research will explore questions of who gets to volunteer and how dimensions of diversity impact on the quality of volunteering experiences. It's also going to explore what good and innovative policies and practices look like in our sector and draw on some good examples, uh, looking at forums work to strengthen the global standard for volunteering for development as a tool to promote inclusive volunteering. In addition to the core research, we're seeking to capture a series of studies of successful approaches that organizations working with international volunteers have taken to diversity and inclusion, including looking at volunteering in the digital world, corporate volunteering, localization and partnerships with organizations in the majority world, sexual harassment and abuse in volunteering, policy considerations for inclusive volunteering, and inequalities and imbalances in research on volunteering for development. I really appreciated the opportunity today to hear from these colleagues discussing how volunteering is shaping institutions, norms, and structures for more inclusive development outcomes. Thank you for including me in this rich discussion. It's been a brief few minutes with you, but I please do get in touch if you have any questions at all about Forum or IFCO 2021. Thanks. Thank you so much, Erin. The upcoming, uh, the upcoming um, conference sounds incredible and amazing, and I'm sure you're going to get such wonderfully thought-provoking, thought um, mental model shifting, um, and and the you know things that push up the assumptions we have about the work that we do generally. Congratulations! I hope everybody will actively participate and respond to the calls for papers and speakers. Um, and, and use this opportunity to really push for change. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody else on the on the plethora of shades in between. Um, we have run 15 minutes over time, so thank you for those that stayed till the end, but this was such a rich conversation, we didn't want to cut it back in any way. Thank you once again to all our panel speakers, as well as to as to Jane from UNV, and of course, Erin uh, from WUSC for, for sharing their final thoughts with us. Uh, we hope you will continue to follow the work of UNV um, as the organizer, and, and all international and domestic volunteering organizations as they drive for transformation, equity, and justice um, in progress and development the world over. It's been my privilege to help moderate this conversation with you today. Thank you for having me on board. And we're looking forward to all the great work that you will all continue to do over the next, over the next near future. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of the week. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.